be seated. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 9 and verse 25. John 9, 25. He answered and said, whether, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. We'll turn the time over to Pastor Gary. Oh, good. We're on. So we're going to talk about guiding principles of knowing God's will. This is part of a series, getting to know God, and not just getting to know God, but getting to know what he wants from us and how we should respond. One of the Proverbs, we're going to talk about four different Proverbs here. You can count them and know how far the sermon is going. Don't let what you don't know confuse you with what you do know. It was 1982, I was in an Eskimo village, and I was running short of gasoline. I get my gasoline once a year in a 55 barrel, 55 gallon barrel drum, and I was running short, and the pastor, 40 miles away on the island, had an extra barrel of gasoline. And he says, hey, I've had this extra barrel for quite some time, Let's meet in the middle, and you can get it. So he's going to come 20 miles. I'm going to come 20 miles, and uh, there's no roads. We're not going to ship it by airplane. We're just going to each take our snowmobile. They call them snow machines, and we'll meet in the middle. Well, I went with somebody who was going to go someplace else, uh, an Eskimo fella, and he got me to the right spot, met the other pastor, we put the 55-gallon barrel of gasoline on my sled. How much does that weigh? Anybody know? 450 pounds. Yeah, it's heavy. So we put it on my sled, and off I went, headed back home again. Um, it was probably March or April, uh, plenty of daylight. Problem is fog. And I was following the track, no roads, no signs. I was following the track, looking, and then the fog came in so that I, I mean, everything is white. There's no rocks. There's no, so trying to follow where I had come before was getting increasingly difficult until the point where I couldn't see tracks at all because of the fog. I couldn't even see my skis on the snow machine. I mean, the fog was really, really thick. So I would lean over as far as I could. There's no more track. So, many possibilities. Number one, it's about zero degrees. Number two, probably not going to last forever right there. I had to do something. I could have panicked. But I went back to this. Don't let what you don't know confuse you with what you do know. So I knew I was headed the right direction. That's good. Last time I was following the track, I knew I was going in the right direction. So I didn't want to go to the right or left or back. I needed to go forward. But where was the trail? Where was the track? And the fog was so thick, I couldn't go away from the snow machine very far or I would lose it. I needed to stay where it was. What I do know, God's watching out over me. 
What I do know is I can pray and he would help me. What I did know, you know, I knew which direction I needed to go. And knowing all of those things, so I wasn't afraid, I wasn't panicked, but I was concerned. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> because, you know, this is a situation in which people can make silly mistakes. And yes, even Eskimos die out there in that kind of wilderness. Now, I had somebody going with me out there, but I was all by myself coming back those 20 miles, and we had gotten up into the mountains. So I prayed. I um, got down right beside the machine, and I found the track just a couple of feet off. And then getting back on the machine, I moved over onto the track, my head over as far as I could so I can keep my eye on the faint little track and kept going very slowly. And, oh, it was half an hour. I don't know how long it was. But the fog cleared, and I was able to get back home with the full tank of gasoline. It was good news. Well, I want to tell you about my one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's from John chapter 9. Jesus was walking along. He saw a man who was been blind from birth. Now, that's a very serious thing. He wouldn't know what anything looked like. Rabbi, his disciples, asked him. So who's asking him this question? His disciples, the people who were with Jesus all the time. Why was this man born blind? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, and, of course, they had their assumptions. Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? There's got to be a reason for this. And they're thinking it's because of sin, because that's what they were taught. That's what the Pharisees taught. And so they kind of bought into that idea. It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. Direct contradiction from the teachings of the Pharisees. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Oh, now we're talking something really different here. The power of God can be seen or revealed in him. You know, all quarter long we've been talking about the crucible experiences. And we're beginning to realize it's not necessarily something we've done wrong. And it's not necessarily people out to get us. It's so that we can be strengthened or God's power can be revealed through us when we get it right. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. Did you uh, catch that? How soon should we do what God has asked us to do? Quickly. Oh, I'll get around to it someday. Uh, maybe next year. It's not really convenient right now. Um, maybe in a couple of years when I have a little more um, ambition or whatever. No, we must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. Jesus is partly talking about us but or himself, but he's also talking about us here. The night is coming and then no man can work. How easy is it to pick pears at night? Well, some people do what I've heard. They have their headlamps and stuff. But I'll tell you, it's easier in the daylight when you've got more light. But while I'm here in the world, I am the light of the world. In other words, things make sense when Jesus' presence, Jesus' will, Jesus' plan is there. Oh, now I get it. And when we realize the crucibles in the Jesus experience, it all makes sense. It becomes clear to us. And you know, when I was on that path up there on St. Lawrence Island, when the fog lifted, everything was very, very clear. I knew exactly where I was. I knew exactly where I was going. And I knew just over that hill, there'd be the village. Then he spit on the ground. Don't do this at home, kids. He spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. 
And I've, I, as I've said before, every time Jesus healed somebody who was blind, he did it differently. There is no magic formula. You do this, and it cures blindness. He did it differently. Every time, it was the same power of God. But the technique of doing it was different, and he chose mud this time. He told them, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. Well, pool of Siloam, that's a mile over there on the other side of the city. So this blind man, wanting to be healed, believed that Jesus was, you know, he didn't know Jesus from anybody else, but he believed that this was hope that he could see again, and so off he went. And, you know, blind people have ways of getting places. So the man went, washed, and came back seeing. It worked. Can you imagine? That's a change of life. Things were going to be completely different from here on out. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was. Others said, no, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I'm the one. Now, this is kept saying, you know, in um, English we don't use this, uh, but in the Greek it's a continuous scent. Just happens again and again and again. Yes, I'm the one. I'm the one that was healed. I used to be that blind beggar. Now I can see. They asked, well, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud, spread it over my eyes, and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. Not very complicated. So I went and washed, and now I can see. That's his testimony. And as you notice as he goes along, he doesn't change his story. Because that's the way it happened, is truth. Where is he now, they asked. I don't know. He couldn't see him when he was doing the applying of the mud. And so he had to go this all the way to the pool of Siloam. And by the time he got back, it must have been a struggle getting back. Probably had to close his eyes so he can figure out how to get back. But anyway, because we look at landmarks. Oh, yeah, this building here, that building there. Yeah, the synagogue's just down there. For him, he got back anyway. I don't know, he replied. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees. If anybody knows what's going on, the Pharisees do. Just ask them. Because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. So it makes a difference when you do mud. Pharisees asked the man all about it, so he told them, he put mud over my eyes, then I, and when I washed it away, I could see. Story hasn't changed. Some of the Pharisees said, this man, Jesus, is not from God, for he's working on the Sabbath. That's how you know if he's working on the Sabbath, can't be from God. That's just the way it is. He's breaking the law. Others said, but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? They got a point. So now we've got a difference of opinion. So there was deep division of opinion among them. Well, who is right? Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? What's your opinion? You know, what's he going to say? I mean, I can see. Is that enough opinion? It's, it's the facts. It's truth. Then the man replied, I think he must be a prophet. Well, to do something miraculous like that, got to be something of that nature. The Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man who had been blind and could now see, so they called in his parents. <laughs> now we're going to get expert witnesses in to find out what really is going on here. They asked them, is this your son? Well, what could they do but admit that? Yes. Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? Well, yes, he's our son, and yes, uh, he was born blind, but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. They weren't there, so they wouldn't know that. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. So this isn't a young child. 
this is a man who had been blind for a number of years. Well, we're back to square one. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. And if you got expelled from the synagogue, that means your eternal life was forsaken. I mean, you were a part of the world. God wasn't going to pay any attention to you at all. That was their belief. That's why they said he's old enough, ask him. They didn't want to get expelled. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this. They got that part right. Because we know that this man is a sinner. In other words, they're telling him, because this man is a sinner, he couldn't have done it. Now tell me your story again, and this time get it right. Well, I don't know whether he is a sinner, the man replied. And how's he going to know that? But one thing he does know. See, what he knows and what he doesn't know. I know this. I was blind, and now I can see. We have got to stick with what we know. There's lots of stuff we don't know, and many of us will tend to speculation or surmisings or guessing or even fortune telling. But I'll tell you this, we need to stick with what we know, and from there we can make rational decisions. But what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? Look, the man replied, I told you once, didn't you listen? Well, if you're stating the facts, why do you need to repeat the facts over and over? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Well, that was the last straw. Them becoming disciples of Jesus? Absolutely not. Then they cursed him. Not a good thing. I don't recommend it for anybody to curse other people. But these were Pharisees. These were religious leaders. They cursed him and said, you are his disciples. We're disciples of Moses, much superior, you see. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. Well, why did they say we don't know where he comes from? Because they knew the story of Jesus' birth. And they knew and suspected it was all illegitimate. Why, that's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from? Well, this man's thinking more and more. He's a prophet. He's a man of God. He is able to do something miraculous. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he's ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. So this is what we know, and this is what we are, you know, this is what we suspect. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. Well, God doesn't bless sinners. Sinners may want selfish things. Uh, sinners may want things that are really not good for them. And, you know, that's just the way it is. They may ask, but God's not going to grant that. He's not going to encourage rebellion. But he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. That is important. And that's where we want to know him and we want to worship him, we want to do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. No record of it anywhere. Pharisees had never heard of it. And this man, who probably was more interested in these things than anybody else, he had never heard of it being done. I'm sure he had already been to the Pharisees, the priests, anybody else, is there any cure for blindness? I'm sure that he heard the same story. It has never been done before. You're stuck with it. Just learn to live with it. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. Well, from what he knew, this is his answer. This is his response. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. The Pharisees answered, you were born a total sinner. We're not listening to you. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. Well, now what's he going to do? Jesus heard what had happened. He found the man and asked him, do you believe in the son of man? And the man asked, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. 
you think he has any faith in Pharisees? The way they treated him, the way they questioned him? No, they weren't even thinking logically. So when he um, asked about the Son of Man, I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshiped Jesus. And Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, to show those who think they see that they are blind. Just because we think something is true, does that make it true? Just because we think we know the way out of the woods, out of the way of the snowy landscape, <laughs> you better be careful because what can happen? You can get lost. And it can be a very dangerous situation. What I know, I believe there is a God who created the world and loves humanity and who gave his life to redeem. This I know. And so anything I don't know, I need to first check with what I do know and then operate accordingly. I believe the Bible is his word to his people. So if I'm in doubt, I need to go to his word and check it out. Find out what is really the direction to go, where God wants me to be. I know God is going to come again. And consequently, then we have hope. I did a graveside service for Warren Harden. Some of you may know her. Um, there was a, a few people there, and we talked about Warren's faithfulness. But we also talked about the hope because Jesus promised to come again. And whenever Jesus promises anything, he fulfills it. And so we're looking forward to that resurrection when uh, Jesus comes again. I know he has been good to me. That's another thing we know. We stop and think about it and we think of all the bad situations. Well, God didn't do that to me. That was my own fault. No, God didn't do that to me. That was my own fault. Well, we think back of the blessings and all the good things that God has provided for us. Yeah, that's his fault. That's what he's done. So he's been good to us. That's another thing that we know. And I know he's answered some of my prayers. Well, I know that's true. He's answered a number of my prayers, and he's also refused to answer some of my selfish requests. Well, for good reason. Well, what I don't know, I don't know why some innocent people suffer more than other people do. We don't know the whole story. We don't know why these tragedies are happening and these people are getting away scot-free. It just doesn't make any sense. I don't know why some of God's followers are so unlike the God they describe. We call them hypocrites. We call them all kinds of unsavory terms. But yeah, it's true. There are people who represent Christ that aren't representing him very well. And we don't know why that is. I don't understand why some prayers seem to be answered and some don't. God knows that. He sees the bigger picture. He has timing we know nothing about. And he also sees the value that we don't see at all. Luke 5, 4 to 6. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper. Let down your nets to catch some fish. Now listen to Simon's response. Master, we worked hard all night and didn't catch a thing. See, that's what he knew. I was up all night, worked hard. I know how to fish. We didn't catch anything. There's luck involved here. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets again. If you say so, he come to a point at this point where he trusted Jesus' words. And since he trusted Jesus' words, well, if you say so, I know what fishing is. And if you say to let down the nets, well, okay, I'll do it. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear Following God is worth it. But Peter, Simon, 
could have insisted, I'm the expert fisherman here. You don't know a thing about fishing. No, he trusted Jesus. If Jesus said it, he was going to believe it. And even though he had already tried many times, he was going to do it because Jesus told him. Um, we're still on number one. We're going to have to do two, three, and four the next sermon. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Jesus was talking about he had just fed the 5,000. Everybody ate, and he had a crowd of people following him. Why? Well, wouldn't you be interested in following the guy who can feed 5,000 people? Yeah, they were very, very interesting. And he was telling them, you've got to eat my flesh. You've got to drink my blood. In other words, what he's saying is, you need to consume me. It's not just, yeah, I know him. Yeah, I'm familiar with who he is. <laughs> no, you've got to get to really know me. And then you can have eternal life. And then you can have the hope of the resurrection. That's what he was talking about. Well, at this point, when he was saying that, people weren't willing to believe, weren't willing to uh, <coughs> take Jesus internally. And so they deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you going, also going to leave? Well, everybody else is leaving. You going to leave too? And Hear the response. Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. This is what Peter knew. And he was going to stick with it. He wasn't going to change his mind at this point. And you know, that's faithfulness. Well, we have lots of people saying, no, that's nonsense. What a waste of time. What a waste of energy. What a waste of money going to a church on a regular basis. Peter says, you are the only ones that have the words of eternal life. It's got to be you. We're sticking with you, not sticking with the crowd at all. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. So could it be that this is blind faith? No, it's not the same as blind faith because there are evidence. There's a, lots of things that we know for sure and we take the next step. Based upon what they know, they negotiate through what they don't know about the world around them. Yeah, we study God's word, lots of things we know, and we move from what we know and not just jump into the unknown and wonder what's going on. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, those three young fellows, Daniel's friends, the God whom we serve is able to save us. This is what they know. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the God's gold statue you have set up. They knew God was the only legitimate God to worship. They weren't under the threat of death, getting burned alive, going to give up what they believed, what they knew to be true, what they counted on for eternal salvation. I would encourage you, and this is the last text I will do. We'll do two, three, and four. They're shorter next time. God wants you to know for sure where you stand. God wants you to know for sure what you believe and not be jumping into the dark and ignoring what you already know to be true. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for your stories. Thank you for your words of wisdom. Thank you for examples of people who were secure in standing on solid ground. Father, help us to be faithful. Help us to do what is right. And Father, we're looking forward to your kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We're going to sing Open My Eyes.